OK, uh, looks good. Uh, so, sir, uh, before I uh, yield the floor to you, uh, I will uh, say a couple words about the agenda, some practicalities. Uh, so hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon and in fact, good evening to those of you attending from India. Uh, today, uh, Mr. Fritz Busemacher uh, will uh, give his expert lecture uh, on the subject of accountability. Uh, personally, this is uh, one of the topics I've been uh, most looking forward to uh, as someone involved in the social and political sciences. Uh, it will be uh, quite illuminating uh, for all of us uh, to gain a macro overview of the uh, socio-philosophical uh, roles, uh, accountability and indeed cybersecurity uh, play uh, in uh, today's uh, zeitgeist. And now, um, as people are joining, I would like to knock a couple uh, practicalities out of the way. Uh, Mr. Busemacher was uh, kind enough uh, to uh, open himself to a brief uh, Q&A session uh, at the end of the lecture. So as usual, uh, please, uh, if you have any questions, uh, observations, interjections and the like, uh, by all means, do drop them in the chat, which I enabled for this session, uh, and we will address them uh, at the end of the expert lecture. Uh, moreover, the session is being recorded. A number of you reached out to me in recent days asking about the availability of uh, lectures that uh, took place previously. Uh, I reply to them that uh, the lectures will be uploaded to Google Drive, uh, cleaned up and uh, uh, the link shared uh, with our students before the end of teaching at the end of this week at the latest. And uh, finally, uh, I would uh, I prepared a bit of an introduction for uh, Mr. Busemacher. So, sir, before I uh, yield the floor to you, uh, let me say a couple words about your background. Uh, Mr. Busemacher works as an independent business community builder and uh, in fact he has spent over 10,000 hours uh, in organizing value by connecting people, connecting ideas and organizations in business communities since 1988. Uh, he seeks to organize serendipity, uh, i.e. Uh, his experience is that uh, unexpected uh, great value is very often to be found by uh, bringing different communities in contact with each other. Uh, he has uh, resulted uh, in uh, numerous uh, program management and uh, consultancy positions focused on uh, bringing together uh, information technology, innovation and the various impacts thereof. And uh, in fact, uh, one of uh, Mr. Busemacher's uh, key communities is the Institute for Accountability in the Digital Age, which uh, I'm sure uh, he'll be uh, telling you about in more detail. I4ADA for short. Uh, he is the chairman of this organization. Uh, this institute was set up in uh, 2017 as the instigation of UNESCO to seek 21st century solutions on how to manage accountability in the digital age. Uh, to help uh, find these solutions, I4ADA is uh, connecting a global multi-stakeholder community consisting of national and local governments, international policymakers and institutes, NGOs, civil society, the ICT industry <laughs> and platforms as well as other relevant bodies. And uh, Mr. Busemacher uh, has been invited to speak uh, at or uh, moderate uh, various events around the world. Uh, he has presented in Africa, Australia, China, Europe, India, New Zealand, South Korea, Sri Lanka and the United States. Uh, he advises and coaches organizations and other communities on community building, collaboration and strategy. Uh, the shift from command and control to connect and collaborate uh, is his uh, guiding motive uh, in uh, his uh, intellectual uh, uh, thinking. And uh, he uh, examples uh, 
Uh, the, the examples of his activity include IT Circle, uh, Netherlands, IPBPM, uh, Portugal, General Council, Netherlands, uh, Dutch Government Innovation Community in the Netherlands, uh, Innovation Network for the Flemish Government, and he also works on a couple pro bono projects such as the ITU AI for Good Global Summit, the YPO's Impact Summit, and Digital Africa. Uh, he has also written various articles for BP Trans, uh, Executive People, and BP Magazine. And uh, he has developed his expertise through various senior commercial positions with a number of organizations, including Logica, uh, Cambridge Technology Partners, and Stuffware uh, Tipco, uh, which he has been uh, conducting in a uh, self-employed capacity ever since 2009. Uh, sir, uh, with that, I would like to yield the floor to you. Uh, very excited for your lecture and uh, uh, keen to uh, ask my questions in the Q&A session as well. Adam, thank you so much for that introduction and I really hope I can live up to it uh, today. Uh, so and everybody welcome joining uh, for this uh, session. Uh, we're going to talk about accountability, but we're foremost going to talk about what's happening in the world, what's changing in the world as we live through this digital transition. Uh, don't be disappointed. I will not have answers. I will only raise questions and make you aware what's happening, because that's the state of play where we are at the moment, and make a couple of observations. And I'd like you to think, what's the implication? What uh, should be thinking about? Uh, so let me see. Yeah, and that also means for the audience, when you listen to the session, I don't want you just to listen as a professional. I also want to, you to listen as a private citizen, uh, as a person who is actually making use of this digital technology. So if everybody's happy with that, uh, we can continue. Uh, at the same time, we uh, not don't only take a technological approach. Uh, also uh, look at the ethical, legal, and social implications. Uh, so we have a holistic view of what technology is doing in the world. Right. Now, it all started with this web page. I don't know who of you recognizes this, but of all the billions of web pages we have in the world, this is the very first one. This is the very first web page developed by Tim Berners-Lee, uh, who was a beta scientist working for CERN in 1989. And this is a website about the World Wide Web. And uh, in uh, April 30th, 1993, uh, CERN uh, sent us out as shareware, allow, uh, so to maximize dissemina dissemination. And boy, did it grow because we now have 5.07 billion people online. That's roughly about 64% of the, uh, the global population are connected on the internet. Now, UK research finds that about 50% of the people uh, think that the internet makes uh, life a lot better. Uh, only about 6% uh, feel uh, that it actually has a negative impact overall. But also we have to realize our relationship with the internet is complicated. Uh, only 12% thinks it's a positive impact on society overall. And in recent surveys, only 5% of the, the people who've been interviewed trust social media platforms with their data and just 36% see search engines as trustworthy. So there's still a lot that we, we need to do. Now, uh, and one of the things we need to do is we need to govern the internet. Now, the states was, I mean, arguably the, the, the underlying technology of the World Wide Web, the internet, is an American invention. And they wrote one of the very first laws uh, for the internet. Uh, and they realized once we not only start to share uh, text and data with each other, where the internet originally was uh, formed for to link uh, link universities to each other, they developed the Consumers De the Communications uh, Decency Act uh, in 1996, uh, and this was an act 
to safeguard children from uh, obscenity, basically trying to um, uh, rule and regulate, uh, uh, you could say, the, uh, avoid child pornography. But a very interesting thing was added to that internet law and that's section 230, which is still uh, active today. And Act 230, uh, I don't know for those of you, I mean, I see Adam, uh, I have to see Adam nodding, so you might know this, uh, this clause. But that means that the ISPs are not legally liable for what's, um, what's going through the internet. So they just, I, I'm not a publisher, uh, so you can't hold me responsible. Uh, arguably, that clause has helped grow the internet to what it is today, those 5.7 billion people. Uh, a little bit later, European uh, followed with more or less the same directive. And at the end of the talk, we will come back to uh, law and legislation. So we came in early. Uh, the way it was designed was actually to help to promote and grow the internet. So the, the share were of the CERN, this law, uh, everything goes, we want to grow this. Um, that was more or less the incentive about uh, 20 years ago. Um, you see that also coming back in how the World uh, Economic Forum uh, fused this. We already had the computer and automation wave, and now we're in the fourth industrial revolution, the cyber physical systems, Basically, we are connecting everything and everybody to each other. Now, I'm going to get, uh, take you through a couple of examples of how that world is changing and what the implications are. Uh, so without any, you could say, uh, context, let me just give you some examples of the world's changing. 20 years ago, if you were going to travel by car, you would see these signs on the roads and it would tell you where uh, the road was congested or not and it would give you advice uh, how to drive. These, uh, it, it was actually quite multi-million uh, uh, dollar systems to help develop these systems. Uh, I have to work for a company developing this particular one, Logic at the time. Uh, but it was government uh, owned, so the, the government controlled this information. It's interesting to see that everybody who travels today will use their mobile app so you're not using a government system, you're, not, you're using a private system developed by Google or another TomTom Tom or uh, Apple, uh, Apple Maps to go from A to B. So it's a shift uh, of attention. Same applies for finance. Traditionally, people bank uh, or, or, or do their financial transactions through a bank, a very highly regulated industry. Um, it was actually surprising a couple of years ago, 2017, I was asked to help organize a finance conference in San Francisco for the Financial Institute of the States. They're talking about innovation. And I asked them, hey, who is your competitor? And they were talking about each other, uh, the other banks. I said, well, have you ever, uh, actually ever heard of M-Pesa? And for those of you who do not know M-Pesa, uh, this is uh, set up by a subsidiary of Vodafone in Africa because they realized almost nobody has a bank account, uh, let alone a credit card. But we all have our mobile phone. We all have credits on that mobile phone. So why don't we use the mobile phone to make uh, micropayments to each other? So rather than using the, the traditional finance system, the technology, the digital technology allowed us to move to a completely different industry to actually do this exactly the same thing. So third example, healthcare. When you are sick, uh, you normally go to a doctor, you go to a hospital. So that's the mindset. You go to a very highly regulated industry and uh, they, they, uh, they try to cure you if you're ill, they operate on you, whatever. And uh, But what's happening through use of technology, and I'm dead certain at least a number of people on this call would have that. You now have an opportunity uh, to use, I mean, I just picked out two Apple examples, but uh, I hope you get, get the point. Now all of a sudden you can use your Apple Watch to uh, keep track of your health. Uh, or you can use an Apple app on your on your iPhone or another phone to check, hey, uh, how can I uh, uh, regulate my body? What's happening? Uh, 
uh, for birth control. Again, uh, the objective is the same thing. You're, you're, you're doing something with your healthcare, but we've now introduced uh, through technology, other industries who are less regulated uh, to, I'd say, take over part of the, the work uh, to deal with your healthcare. So that's already a trend going on, and I'd leave it up to the audience to decide is this desirable or not, is this ethical or not, because um, the question is all that data which is being collected uh, through M-Pesa, through Google, uh, through uh, these apps. Um, what are we going to do with that data? Uh, and uh, what did we sign up for? That is actually one of the basic questions for today. And uh, what happened the last couple of years with COVID, um, I think pre-COVID, um, we had um, a lot of technology was nice to have, specifically in the business environment. But I think COVID has demonstrated uh, us that digital technology is uh, a fundamental part of our uh, organization. And it has, uh, I'd say, accelerated that digital transition. So that's the observation. That's the, the fourth industrial wave, which uh, the World Economic uh, Forum is talking about. But if that's the case, what are the issues? Is this something we should be happy with or, or not? So I'm going to take you through a couple of things which is happening in the world. Uh, again, um, and thank you, by the way, for Aman for pointing out that uh, uh, the use of UPI in India. Uh, thank you. Th these are the comments also which help me learn every day. Uh, but I'm going to take you through some um, examples uh, of what's happening and where now things are going wrong. So I'm going to give you three and uh, the three main areas where we need to talk about accountability. First of all, in media and social media, then I'm going to talk about uh, AI and then we end with uh, cybersecurity. Just some examples. So what's happening in social media today? This is a picture of a website, uh, an, an e-business platform, uh, where you can uh, buy a shoe or not. It's very normal, uh, I would say. Uh, but, uh, okay, uh, I'll, I'll ask it rhetorical, given that it's quite difficult to communicate at the moment. You might see a hair on the screen, on the white shoe. So what do you normally do when you look at something like this on your on your phone and you see hair? You want to swipe it away. But guess what? This is not an actual hair, uh, uh, physical hair on your iPhone. This is programmed uh, in the app to force you to swipe uh, and actually brings you to a website you were not looking for. And this is a great example of nudging. It's a way to allow you to, to, to have you do something you were not consciously uh, interested in doing. So here, a very smart uh, programmer has used this to drive you in the direction you were not interested in. And this is a form of what's called nudging. And once you see this, then the question is, is this very clever advertising or is this something from an ethical point of view we do not want uh, to have and i'll give you some other examples i don't have pictures but i'll just uh, give you some examples of how uh, i would say evil nudging uh, uh, forces an individual to make a choice uh, and alter his decision which you normally uh, weren't uh, we, we, which you constantly didn't want to make because uh, some examples maybe you've never heard about, but nagging. Uh, these are apps which continuously uh, ask you, for instance, to uh, put on your location uh, uh, service so, so people can start to track you. Uh, obstruction, uh, Amazon is a very good example of a bad, or actually bad example, because it's all virtually impossible to um, uh, leave Amazon and kill your account. Uh, 
it even went, uh, you also see in situations what's called sneaking. Uh, for instance, when you signed up for an account, you automatically um, uh, opt in for a newsletter. You did not sign up for it, but you automatically get it. So it, it touches on the, do we want to go default opt in or opt out? Um, and uh, another example is uh, forced action. Um, uh, as a user, sometimes you are forced to do something, uh, otherwise to, to get uh, access to particular functionality you're looking for. So these are all examples how the, the developers of these websites we're using force you, nudge you to do something you may not uh, want to do. Now, when we're talking about Amazon buying something, if we want to talk about shoes or we want to talk about um which okay, going to Facebook, which is actually an example, is they, they replace tracking with personalization. So we call it personalization, but when you when you personalize something, it actually means we're going to track exactly what you're doing. You could argue, okay, so what? Is that important or not? Uh, maybe I'm directed to shoes I didn't want to buy, but I may or may not like them. But exactly the same technology has also been used by Cambridge Analytics. So Cambridge Analytics, uh, and I'm dead certain everybody knows about this, uh, has followed the news, has been using exactly the uh, same technology to steer the decision of elections in the States and the Brexit discussion in the UK as two big examples, to nudge society to do something which they maybe not wanted, uh, would want to do in the first place. Um, so this is where technology becomes quite dangerous uh, because we, we're messing with uh, the society we want and a couple of people who use this technology to the benefit to uh, go for an outcome they want. Now, when this happened, Mark Zuckerberg was called uh, for the Congress and that was, I believe, in 2018. Um, he said, uh, he, he did take ownership, said, hey, hey, I am responsible. At the end of the day, I started Facebook, I run it, I'm responsible for what happens here. Uh, and initially, his reaction was, um, let's um, try to mitigate the risks I have as Facebook by downplaying what actually happened. Uh, but the story never uh, really stopped, so it was actually good that a year later, Mark Zuckerberg was actually addressing clause 230, which was mentioned in the beginning as the internet law, said, well, maybe it's time that we need to rethink uh, legislation and think, hey, what are we really responsible or not? So um, this is where technology is influencing um, um, our behavior. And also, I'm pleased that we have um, governance, governing institutes like uh, the US uh, Congress, which then hold the people accountable. Hey, uh, your company, you as a person, uh, have done something which um, you should not be doing. Uh, a third example when it comes to nudging. Uh, I can't raise hands or not, but uh, I want to talk a little bit about the suicide game, which is uh, a, a, a something which was programmed by Philip uh, Budikin. Now, uh, Philip was uh, somebody from uh, Russia, and through uh, smart use of uh, profiling uh, and through smart use of nudging, he started to invite people to join the suicide game, or actually the blue whale game, as it's called. It's uh, the blue whale game uh, is 50 steps, and the first step was uh, okay. Uh, read a scary book and post a picture online. This is a scary book. Uh, maybe step two, step three was uh, take a small, uh, take a knife and cut yourself. Uh, but the last step, unfortunately, was find the highest building in your local city. Uh, go to the top and jump off. And the government of India found out about this blue whale game because they saw a lot of suicides being committed by people which did not 
meet the normal profile in India because these are quite affluent kids who normally not uh, commit suicide. So eventually they found out this this game existed and it's uh, I'd say a very I'd say black way of using uh, nudging technology to uh, get people to uh, self harm. But now the fundamental question is which. Uh, when it comes to accountability, uh, this uh, Philip Budikin lives in Russia, uh, and, this, and the, these uh, suicides are committed uh, in India. So it's crossing borders. The cyberspace doesn't recognize that uh, physical boundary. So the big question for the Indian government at the time is um, how can we stop this from happening? We don't want to, um, and we also have a couple of other principles as India. Uh, we want to keep the open, uh, uh, the internet open and free of, uh, free of access. But how can we cut this off? Because um, we cannot uh, approach the, the people who actually developed the game. The servers are also not in India. So this was a good example, uh, also used by UNESCO at the time when we set up the Institute for Accountability, as uh, this was one of the prime examples which we used to demonstrate why we need to have an international discussion, how, we'll, how we deal with uh, such technologies. Uh, now, these are just a couple of um, examples in the social media space where the whole discussion on accountability originated, and I'll come back to that a little bit later on. But it also moved to the AI space. So just a couple of examples of what's happening there. This is a picture of one of the, te the, the Teslas. And um, you see a lot of questions or debates online about self-driving cars. Do we want a self-driving car or not? Uh, and what are, you could say, the requirements for a self-driving car uh, in the case an accident happens, uh, who's responsible, uh, how hackable is the system, uh, how far do we want to go with autonomy, uh, what's the ethical side that if we allow a driver to do something else that in the very last moment uh, we want them to take over again, uh, is that uh, one second before the crash, potential crash, two seconds, ten seconds, those are the type of questions which need to be answered. But what's actually behind uh, the, the, the big issue uh, about self-driving cars is um, if you are as a person in a car and there happens to be an accident, an accident, for instance, where you need to, as a driver, to avoid something, you react to that particular situation. And as a result of your action, you hit another car or you hit a bicycle or whatever. Uh, from a legal perspective, you reacted um, in a situation which is fast mature. But now, what's the difference between reacting as a driver and a self driving car? And that is a self driving car, in order to make that, uh, to react to that particular situation. It needs to be programmed. It needs to be programmed and make a decision up front. So basically, the, the, the outcome of that reaction is programmed and it's pre baked in the system. And that's where it becomes legally quite dicey because now all of a sudden you have a reaction versus a decision. One is uh, force majeure, you cannot do something about that. But in the other case, uh, it's not for sure because you you thought about this maybe years or months ahead because we put that in the, the program. So, and then the question comes when something does happen as an accident, who is then accountable? The driver who could not uh, react in time to avoid an accident, or maybe the delivery of the deliver of the car, or the person who did, who actually wrote the algorithm and put that decision in the algorithm. Uh, Probably a well-known example for the most of you, but what's behind that is that very fundamental significant difference between is it a reaction or a decision. So 
is it something accountable or not accountable? Uh, a couple of other examples. Uh, push the right button now. Uh, AI and patents. Uh, this is not a story about patenting AI systems, but this is a completely different story I'd like to share with you uh, people. And that is, can AI itself be granted a patent? And the thing is, the answer is yes. Not in every country in the world, but South Africa is believed to be the very first country in the world to award a patent to an invention created by an artificial intelligence. Uh, basically, it was an interlocking food and beverage container based on fractal geography. Uh, so, and that's been awarded a patent by South Africa's Companies and Intellectual Property Commission. So, we're now living in a world where we're not giving a person a patent, we're actually giving a piece of technology a patent and not the person who developed the AI, but the AI itself. Now, in this case, um, South Africa has granted uh, the patent. Uh, uh, Australia was also asked the patent, but also now you see the difference in uh, thinking about AI that, for instance, the, the, the EPO, the European Patent Office, completely rejected uh, the patent request the same applies for the US, US Patent Office who claimed um, only, who, who stated only a person, a live person can get a patent. But hopefully you get the gist of what is already possible in today's society. So the individual, uh, you could say stories, you can maybe live with, but I want you to add up all the stories we're going to talk about. Because let me give you another example. This is a picture I took in Geneva in 2017. This is a picture of Sophia. Sophia is a robot, uh, an Android robot, and she presented at the very first AI for Good Summit, which I helped organize. I'll come back to that a little bit later. And arguably enough, uh, and I, well, it's up to you. Is this a marketing uh, uh, stunt or not? But in 2017, Sophia, as a social robot, was given the citizenship of Saudi Arabia. So this robot, Sophia, in South uh, in Saudi Arabia, has exactly the same rights as the next person. Is that something we want or not? So again, if she does something, or actually because it looks like a woman, I call her she, but if this robot does something, is it the robot the only person to blame? Because we can look, at it's actually a citizen, so uh, it has full autonomy. Or um, uh, it, do we still have to go back to the people who developed uh, uh, the robot? Steve, uh, Steve Hansen, by the way. This is probably the scenario which also Stephen Hawking thought of because he warned us about AI. He was very fearful that thinking machines could one day take over. And uh, th this is maybe a glimpse into the future he was so uh, concerned about, and maybe we should as well. It's not all do uh, gloom and doom, but I just want to share this with you. Okay. This was very recently in the news, uh, AI and science. Obviously, there's a lot of science reports on artificial intelligence. But this is a case where a Swedish uh, professor uh, asked an AI bot to write a scientific paper about itself. And within about two hours, that paper was written. And then the science said, oh, was actually quite shocked because this looked a little bit like Pandora's box. Did, did I actually open something I should not have, have opened? But um, the question, the thought process now is, because also the, the scientific researcher uh, then asked, uh, Thunstrom, by the way, um, do you want to publish this paper and do you want to propose this? uh to a particular journal and the ai uh, actually said yes uh please do so we now have a situation where ai is seen as a citizen 
an AI could hold a patent and an AI might be able to write scientific papers. Uh, maybe it, this is an AI which actually could pass the Turing test. We don't even know it's AI and cannot recognize it from an AI to a person. But that's the, the world we're not growing into, which that's the world we're already in our, right now. Uh, okay, I'm going to end something. I don't know if it's fun or not. Uh, this is a, a very nice project by a Belgian guy called the Dries Porter. What you, I don't know if you can see my pointer on the right, uh, on, uh, right here, but you see here an Instagram picture. This is a guy with a Brazilian flag uh, on Times Square in New York. Oh, sorry. And here we see somebody in Dublin uh, in front of a pub. And his um, uh, art project was, and I'll see if I can run it again, uh, is that you can now upload a picture uh, uh, to his website. It's actually called The Follower. So upload your instant photographs. And then he's going to use AI technology to look at all the available public uh, cameras, uh, which you can access to, to assess, can I actually use the public cameras to find out where you are or not? And guess what? Uh, these are all examples where the his AI engine was able to locate where this picture was taken around the globe. Uh, on one hand, it's funny that to see that technology is actually capable of doing this. But the scary thing is that this is just public domain uh, images he's using. So it's not, but just imagine what data is already being collected uh, by organizations about how we move and uh, uh, you could say in the public domain. So I don't know if it's scary, uh, I, uh, but it's something you have to realize, is this a world we want to live in or not? Okay. So what's happening in cybersecurity? Uh, hopefully the sign will work. Adam, is the sound on? Uh, it's, it's not audible, uh, but uh, we can see the video. Sorry, I realize, sorry, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I realize why uh, you can't hear the sound, but this is an, a commercial of eight years ago in the Netherlands, which is a spoof on uh, a typical Apple presentation, which is showing all the technology we uh, put in our house, but also realizing that that technology uh, can be hacked and we can steal it. And even it, it, and it, if you have that phone, uh, then actually you can uh, rob your whole house of all this great technology. Um, I'll share the link to the video uh, with the slides for those of you who want to play it back. It's actually quite funny with the sound on. Uh, but it's an example of uh, how the digital technology can now um, help people who want to um, do damage, do, want to do harm, uh, actually help them uh, increase the chances. Um, it's not happening, uh, it's not only happening in the normal software system we talk about, it's also happening uh, in the SCADA systems around the world, becoming a little bit more scarier. Uh, so uh, this is just an, a, a typical picture of a SCADA system. So these are the gas pipelines in the world. But we've already seen examples where, for instance, the Colonial Pipeline Company in the United States, which operates a five and a half thousand mile uh, pipeline that delivers 
about 45% of the gasoline uh, uh, jet fuel, um, that they've been a victim of ransomware attack. Um, so we now see that operators, uh, I'm not stating if they're state operators or not, but operators have been able to um, uh, uh, hold uh, big infrastructure organizations uh, ransom, and uh, a lot of money has been ch changed hands to uh, take that away. For those of you who do not recognize this picture, but this is one of the great scenes in the James Bond movie, Tomorrow Never Dies from 1997. Yes, Adam, I see a smile. Uh, I love this movie. And one of the plots in this movie is that uh, they, chi they shifted uh, the satellites uh, so that not only was this like a stealth ship, but they could not find the ship because the GPS, uh, because of the GPS um, uh, satellites, they were looking in the wrong direction. It's a bit of a plot. Now, this was pure science fiction. It was a great movie. But we also have seen this happening. So th this happened. So this is the Evergreen in the Suez Channel. And uh, follow the debates online and there's been some conference about it uh, as a result of this happening over 300 vessels you could say were stuck at both ends of the channel and because of that uh, probably uh, an estimated 9.6 billion uh, worth in trade uh, was prevented so that was a, a big huge loss um, and there has has been talks that this wasn't an accident, but this was a deliberate um, action where they were able to um, uh, go into the SCALA system of the ship and just and steer the ship's rudder just out of course with a couple of degrees that it ran on the ground and, and it caused this accident. Now, arguably, if this happened or not, uh, that's actually uh, less relevant if it's an accident or not. What is relevant, because it could have happened, uh, one of the very big insurance companies in the world, Allianz Global Corporate, um, did an assessment and released a safety and shipping review in uh, uh, 21. And the key takeaway is that this could be a realistic cyber attack scenario. And because it's been seen as a realistic cyber attack scenario, the companies now all being part of that value chain uh, in this logistic global logistic, uh, supply chain, to what extent can they now be held accountable uh, to uh, mitigate the risks for loss prevention in case of a cyber attack does happen? So even if this is ha happened because of a cyber attack or not, the fact that it could have happened has introduced uh, a liability issue with the, P the organizations in the supply chain. So, scary stuff. Again, uh, maybe I'll skip this. Uh, I'm going to skip this video because uh, the sound is off, but all examples of how technology is uh, changing in society. And I realize I'm conscious of the time, so I have to really move up a bit. But so what's happening? Why do we need accountability? Why aren't we talking about responsibility? Uh, well, accountability is the, funda uh, the fundamental point is attempting to address the question when the buck stops here. Basically, responsibility is about taking ownership. Accountability is measuring the results. And also when the results are not according to what we've agreed according to satisfaction, then we, there is somebody who uh, we can point to say, hey, you should have fixed this. Uh, you, uh, you, you should, you're responsible, you should, you should fix this. So accountability, responsibility is looking ahead. Accountability is looking um, uh, looking back and assess if something happened or not. And we also have to realize that accountability is the fundamental prerequisite on which a lot of the other 
let's say, as, uh, aspects we want technology uh, to be uh, built upon. So it's like fairness, reliability, privacy, security, inclusiveness, and very important transparency. This also means that given all these technological examples I give of how we can abuse technology, we also still at the end of the day have to realize accountability is a human issue and not a technological issue. So given all these examples I just given today, I want to share this quote with you from Admiral Michael Rogers, Director NSA, uh, today the former Director NSA. But we're in a position today where digital te uh, technology has outstripped the legal and standards framework. So this law, which I share with you, is a great law, uh, but we're now seeing the, the, the negative effects that we've had this law for over 20 years. Good thing is we're now implementing lots of new legislation to um, keep up with modern times, like the Digital Services Act, which, which uh, uh, we presented to the, the European Parliament. Uh, uh, which uh, is an update of an existing act, but uh, preventing gatekeepers from imposing unfair conditions. This is uh, a, a great act to help, uh, 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 you could say, um, uh, end users. But the fact that the, the question remains, um, referring to also what Michael Rogers says, is this the way to go? And I'll give you a small anecdote of uh, what uh, happened. So we know we need to talk about technology. So. Um, as mentioned, I'm part of the, uh, the AI for Good movement. Uh, in the very first two years of the conference, we only talked about what AI could do and what the business benefits uh, do. But these are pictures of the third year, where finally we started, I realize you probably can't see that, but we finally started to realize we need to talk about accountability as well, because we realize AI can do so much, we need to... Uh, look at the fundamental prerequisite to keep on governing technology we develop. But this is a picture I took in 2019 with, this was when Newt Gingrich came to the Netherlands and Newt Gingrich, the former Speaker of the House of the USA. Uh, I had the honor to also ask him a brief question and Newt uh, is a lawyer, so I asked him what's his take on uh, accountability in a digital age. And he gave it um, a, a thought and then said, it's just like the invention of a car. Uh, when we had a car, uh, the, 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 the very first time a car came, came into a town, we'd have people walking in front of the car with a red flag. And then when the car passed the town, uh, that was it. It took us about 10, 20 years to uh, incorporate the laws to regulate uh, traffic. Uh, we have about 150 people in the room, about 100 of those people say, yeah, that's actually quite nice. I mean, the internet uh, and digital technology is just another invention. So the principle to accept it as just another invention as you did uh, was fair uh, uh, by those 100 people. But there was also a minority in the room, I've uh, realized in hindsight, who I would argue were a little bit more IT savvy and then realized that we don't have 10, 20 years and we cannot wait for 10, 20 years until we came up, come up with a law which actually um, starts to regulate this digital technology. So we really need to rethink how we're going to um, govern technology and this point is just i mean one observation but this is an observation as a very relevant important lawmaker um, we don't we, time is a very essential element in uh, our discussion so we need to speed up the process of uh, thinking about um, uh, digital technology and that became very apparent when uh, europe implemented the gdpr because the GDPR uh, is the law which we created, uh, it's the right to be forgotten, which is a great law. I mean, I'm very glad we have that. But the minute this law got uh, came into place, uh, we also started asking questions. Well, hey, how about uh, if we put things in the blockchain? And then uh, what's interesting, uh, GDPR uh, means the right be to be forgotten it actually implicitly assumes that we store uh, things in relational database. So if you put something in a database, you can take it out again if you desire uh, as such. 
blockchain assumes that once it's in the blockchain, you cannot get it out anymore because that's the whole essence of the blockchain. So now we have two completely opposing forces. So here we see a new technology disrupting a law which we've put in place, um, the right to be forgotten. And my point is not this disruption, but the point is the reaction of two European governments. So what did the Dutch government do? We have a very, I would say, pragmatic culture. And said, you know what? if you throw away the blockchain key, we effectively thrown away the system, so we cannot access the system anymore. So you can still use the blockchain as long as you throw away the key. In Germany, they said, well, hold on. It's still in the system, and we may not be able to retrieve that uh, information if we throw away the key today. But look at other technologies which are coming uh, fast. Look at quantum computing. We might be able to re replicate the key using quantum technology in five or 10 years' times. So we will not allow you to store it in the blockchain. So the fact that we have made an assumption how we store data, and then almost in the same month, we, we realized that we might have new technology which uh, actually jeopardizes that law, resulted in two different ways we then interpret that law and what we're going to do with it. And that's the, the thing we need to think about. So that's also why UNESCO realized we need to do something about this issue. And that is, uh, if we try to have this discussion within the walls of the UNESCO system, uh, we're not going to, uh, we're going to run out of time. That's going to be the Newt Gingrich approach. We're going to take 10, 20 years to have a discussion. So we need to speed up the process. So uh, one of the things they did is they helped set up this Institute for Accountability. So actually we are an instrument set up by UNESCO outside the walls of UNESCO to speed up the process. We still make use of UNESCO's Rome principles to set up a discussion uh, around rights, openness, access, and multi-stakeholder uh, participation. So we're not only talking about the solutions. We started off talking about how we should actually have that discussion, which resulted in two great summits. And this is a picture of the Peace Palace. So in 2018 and 19, we had two very high level global uh, multi-stakeholder communities to talk about First of all, the awareness that we need that discussion on accountability, but uh, we also need to think about what are the modern tools. Uh, these are some pictures. Uh, so we had an opening by Vin Cerf, the inventor of the, uh, the internet, but we also had the deputy prime minister. We had Hu Zhao, the secretary general of the ITU. And we had uh, people like, uh, happens to be here, Gary Shapiro, uh, the president of the Consumer Technology Association. So some very high level people thinking about what's the issue, why is it an issue? And actually Gary is quite a, a nice example. When I invited Gary to come over to have a discussion, he said, well, if, you, if I come to Europe, I come to a government led legislation uh, model. And in the States we want, a Europe, we want an industry led legislation model. We want self-governance. And that's, I think, the key issue with trying to regulate technology which does not recognize geographic boundaries is for exactly the same question, we will have different results based on different regions in the world. And that's the, why we still don't have final solutions, but we have uh, routes to possible solutions how to deal with that. Uh, moving on quite quickly, I'm conscious of the time. So we've regulated the charter which i'll share with you not i'm going to skip that uh, we have a report with some ideas of speakers i want to point out to the website where we've done over 50 interviews and counting where we are gathering insights of people around the world and just picked out three people from india uh pavandu gal uh, lata and uh, pradeep who, share, who gave us their insights on how to deal with accountability. So very worthwhile just to listen to their ideas of what possible solutions are. And I'll give you an idea of a couple of solutions we're thinking of. First of all, we need to go with transparency. I, the, 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 we haven't talked to a single stakeholder who doesn't want transparency to happen because the minute we, we offer transparency of how 
what the data is we're using, who is you, who's making the use uh, of the data, and how uh, a, an algorithm works. Uh, we create a balance. Um, I'm not given the time uh, now, uh, can't cover everything, uh, but point out some very promising ways how we're going to make use of uh, uh, modern thinking uh, to govern technology and speed up the pace of legislation development. First of all, a very big push to move from a rule-based um, law to a principle-based. Uh, that doesn't seem like much, but that's going to be a very fundamental difference between how we're going to govern technology. So we're not going to measure exactly what's possible or not possible, but we're going to have judges now uh, make an assessment based on what's the principle behind the thinking. Uh, that combined with transparency will help us. And the same applies for using technology to govern technology. Um, small example, Instagram, uh, in, that happened to be in Hong Kong, they found out that uh, not only was there an update of the software technology, there was also an update of the terms and conditions in a software uh, update. And then uh, the terms and conditions stated that any photo you post on Instagram, actually the ownership is with Instagram and also in any future technology developed by Instagram. And that uh, was a, a lucky chance somebody f found out, hey, we probably don't want that. So Instagram needed to uh, take that out again. But that's probably in a lot of the terms and conditions in a lot of the technology we use today and there's a uh, there's a research done by a university in the states which has calculated that you need about 72 working days to read all the terms and conditions of all the technology you have on your la laptop iphone and the computer back home nobody has read those so one of the things people are now looking at let's look at ai engines to govern uh, this technology because they will be able to recognize the patterns where things have been changed or not um, I want to make use, uh, uh, give the opportunity to also um, open the question if there are any questions. So uh, I'm going to stop uh, sharing. And uh, Adam, I apologize, I ran out of time a little bit, uh, but hopefully maybe there are still some uh, questions. I'll make sure that no the slides with all the references. The slides and the references will be uh, made available. Um, uh, and maybe there are a couple which we can still cover. At least what I will do, I promise that all the que uh, questions in the chat, I will uh, react to offline uh, 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 through Adam. But the point I wanted to make is technology is moving fast. The legal and regulatory framework as we know it today, cannot keep up with. So we need to rethink uh, new ways to govern technology. And so it's a search for, let's say, 21st century solutions, 21st century regulations for this 21st century issue. So every time you look at a technology, take that into account. Uh, thank you so much for your expert insights, yeah. sir. Um, we have uh, four questions in the chat and uh, one observation that Aman sent me an email yeah. due to a technical yeah. difficulty. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Would you like to speed run uh, through them real quick? Uh, yes, uh, let's see what uh, if we're having the same questions. Uh, let's see, yes. Constantine, yeah. Uh, on Hana. the topic of personal data. Uh, okay, could, yeah, maybe you can help me. Um, yes. Hana was the uh, first one, yeah. if okay. I'm not mistaken. Yeah. yeah. OK, I have to read the question first. Um, uh, currently, social media companies and their highly are domestic laws. Uh, yes and no, and uh, that's what for instance, the IGF, the Internet Governance Forum, is trying to work on uh, to get international legislation in play. 
And I did not cover that in the, uh, you could say the Digital Services Act, but that's been seen as the, the gold standard for the future. Um, the Digital Services Act, um, let me check, uh, actually has uh, a clause in the Digital Services Act, which sets uh, a new number of obligations designed uh, for the VLOPs, which is called the Very Large Online Platforms. So what Europe has done is said, um, anybody can still provide their technology, but uh, if you uh, are a VLOP, a very large online platform, in this case, that means Google, that means Microsoft, that means Amazon, uh, then you are obliged um, to up, uh, you could say, to adhere to uh, European law. And they've, uh, I believe, they've uh, designed uh, the, and these are platforms with more than 45 million average monthly users in the European Union. So um, when you talk about, and I think that's going to be the very pragmatic way this is going to be resolved, um, that you will see strong economic entities in the world taking the lead for what needs to be a global discussion. So very a pragmatic way to answer that question is you see Europe leading the way, setting a gold standard on how to deal and uh, with uh, rules and regulations. And uh, hopefully uh, United Nations will uh, keep up in the future. Uh, if that's going to happen, nobody knows, but that is uh, to, to some extent a question. So, uh, Hannah, very much I urge you to look at the the consumer, the, uh, uh, yeah, the, um, the Digital Services Act as an example of how we start to use to regulate on an international level. Okay. Uh, do you have time for two more questions? Yeah, oh, sir? Yeah, oh, oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have the time. Um, so, Constantine, um, I'm not an expert in N N NFTs, uh, but I think you had a good point there. Uh, so, I'm assuming everybody can read the same question about uh, if um, personal data in the hands of end users again uh, can be, uh, if we can use uh, NTFs. Yes. Uh, I believe you're on the right track. I've, I was in Malaysia in September where we saw that discussion taking place as a viable solution. So not 100% I can endorse that, but I think that's the right, the, the right thinking. And the same question there, how can we take both next proxies into account when thinking about accountability? Um, when I think about uh, accountability in the digital age, it applies to any technology out there, uh, which uh, includes uh, botnets as well. So we should not include, uh, uh, exclude that. And it's only going to increase that. Um, yeah, I will uh, provide the links to the video shown, so you have an idea of what uh, I wanted to share with you. Thank you. Uh, Adam, is, is there anything else I've missed? Otherwise, uh, I don't want to hold people uh, longer than needed. Yes, maybe one last question from uh, Siddhartha. Yeah. Uh, does the state's okay. awareness of citizens make a difference when it comes to accountability? If so, in what capacity? Uh, does the state's awareness of citizens? Uh, I don't know if it's possible for Siddhartha if he could maybe um, expand on that question because I do not know if I understand the question. Uh, if, I, is this the... I, I believe he means the uh, information that the state possesses yeah. uh, on yeah. its citizens or perhaps surveillance. Yeah. Um, well, what I wanted to show you, uh, share with you that video of the Belgium uh, artist is to make people aware how many data is already out there in the public domain. And, uh, and this calls for, uh, I would say, 
a need for people to be aware how much data is already being collected. And that's also why transparency is such a very fundamental prerequisite because being transparent on what you um, have uh, as data as a government, I think uh, will allow you to then determine is this something I desire or not. And that's also then uh, what that means is um, we need some kind of uh, fundamental, uh, I'd say, digital education. Um, good example is Singapore. I happen to have the opportunity to interview Choi Peng Wu, the former CIO of Singapore. And uh, digital skills in Singapore are just assumed. Uh, we have them, but they've been working on that for 30 years. So the way they look at digital technology uh, in Singapore is way different from a lots of countries around the world. Because they've grown up with digital technology, I would argue they are not scared of the digital technology and they have a very much better understanding of what it potentially can do. That still means uh, you have to decide to accept that states have so, so, so much data or not. But I think it starts with educating people what digital technology means. So I'm a strong advocate to um, educate at an early age. I mean, I, I'm a digital migrant myself. I grew into digital when I was 18. Uh, I'm still catching up. So, yeah, uh, when it comes to accountability, uh, please educate yourself and make sure that everybody is ed educated around you. Not certain if this answered the questions, but that's my first thought and reaction. And uh, I also give some uh, Samir some uh, more examples offline on rule versus principle based. Actually, the 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 Digital Services Act of the European Commission is an example of a principle based uh, legislation. And the Digital Market Act, which is its, its sister, is also uh, based on the same principles. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, I, I see a number of students uh, expressing their gratitude uh, in the chat. I would like to join them in doing so. Uh, I, I feel that uh, your contribution to this year's cyber school was uh, particularly valuable, considering the pressing nature of the issues you addressed and your ex expert insights uh, have been uh, deeply appreciated. I, I uh, feel that a lot of us found uh, yeah. today's session very enlightening. Yeah. Um, with that, uh, uh, we really hope to see you next year as well. You can count on me. Uh, I'll update uh, the examples because we're going to have lots of new examples next year. And uh, it was my pleasure and honor, and I hope I got everybody thinking about what's happening. So this may be disappointed that you don't have solutions yet, but we are still at a point we need to think about what's happening. And that's why it starts with being, uh, aware, being aware of what the, the risks and issues are. So thank thank you. you so much, sir.